Mr. Watson, come here. I want you. Alexander Graham Bell, 1876. Chapter 17. Telephone. 17.1. Harmonious Bells. The story of the telephone's discovery is famous. A patent was granted to Bell on March 7, 1876. Elisha Gray, another inventor, had filed a caveat and intent to file a patent on a telephone on March 7, 1876 as well, a few hours later. The first application of voice over wire, Mr. Watson, come here, I want you, was spoken just three days after Bell had filed the patent. It is worth noting that this first spoken telephone conversation was a request for transportation, Bell asking Watson to travel to his location. Bell and Watson had been working on a harmonic telegraph, and voice was not the first priority. The Bell Telephone Company was chartered in 1877. While Gray did not get the patent or fame, don't cry for him, he went on to work for Western Union, co-founded their subsidiary Western Electric, and invented an early fax machine. Patent suits raged between the Bell interests and the Western Union Edison interests. By 1879, the party settled with Western Union selling to the Bell interests telephone exchanges in 55 cities and a network serving 56,000 subscribers. In 1881, Western Electric, which acquired Western Union's telephone manufacturing arm, was sold to American Bell Telephone Company. By 1880, there were 30,000 telephone subscribers in the United States. By 1881, 50,000. By 1888, 160,000. In 1881, the telephone was only five years old, and there were tens and soon hundreds of thousands of customers. In 1885, the American Telephone and Telegraph Company, AT&T, was founded to build and operate long-distance services connecting local telephone companies. Theodore Vail, a first cousin once removed of telegraph financier Alfred Vail, was the first president of this company, serving for four years. In 1899, AT&T assumed control of and became the parent company of the Bell System. The discussion in this chapter focuses on the telephone and some follow-on systems. The structural and behavioral parallels to transportation systems will be noted. Seventeen point two, regulation ringing. In 1907, AT&T was in trouble and recalled an elderly Theodore Vale from South America, where he was running a transit company to again head the company. Reviving their fortunes in 1909, Western Union and American District Telegraph, ADT, as well as some other telegraph companies, came under the control of AT&T, giving truth to the telegraph and the AT&T name. However, by 1913, the Department of Justice required AT&T to divest its telegraph interests. With the Kingsbury commitment, AT&T agreed to the divestiture and agreed to provide long-distance service to non-affiliated local telephone companies. It could only purchase other companies if the Interstate Commerce Commission approved, which it did for 271 of 274 cases. In return, its telephone monopoly was insured. Corporate stasis for some 70 years set in as AT&T was able to maintain its monopoly through government protection. The predominant technology of the telephone system hardened in the late 19th century and the government began to intervene. It is interesting that policy incorporated transportation learning, the roles of state public utility commissions and the Federal Communications Commission mirror transportation roles. It is also interesting that the market for the telephone was difficult to imagine in the early days, and that's been true for transportation systems. The product of the system was highly valued, and there was demand for deployment locally and then at larger scales. While in the telephone industry, government assisted and enabled, almost no government financing was required in the early days, which contrasts with many transportation technologies and the telegraph. A few local governments developed facilities. With local use dominant and long-distance expensive, the State Public Utility Commission's PUCs looked after policy problems. As time went along, the long-line, long-distance system developed, and conflicts between firms emerged as a policy issue. AT&T used its long-line monopoly power in attempts to acquire those local companies it had not already acquired. The Kingsbury commitment logic had become known as the essential facilities doctrine in antitrust laws. If one company's facilities are essential to the operations of another, use of the facilities must be allowed. AT&T was forced to allow non-Bell locals to connect to the long lines under the same terms as the Bell locals. The story so far is quite transportation in character. A new service becomes available and there's clamor for service. Perhaps we should remark that the essential facilities doctrine was a problem for the railroads too. It was managed in a different fashion, creation of interchange rules by the American Association of Railroads, AAR, and Interstate Commerce Commission, ICC, referee of joint rates, but with little difference in substance. At about this time, the corporate ownership character of the AT&T system had evolved to the form that it held until the 1982 consent decree. 
AT&T owned the long lines, the Western Electric Company, equipment supplier, and Bell Labs. It controlled most of the local companies. Is that ownership situation exceptional? We see it as a how-the-die-fell outcome. It's a matter of the point in time when concentration in industry was stopped. Who knows what the ownership situation in rail would have been if the ICC had not put a stop to change. The highway component of the auto highway system did not see a stop put on it, and a layered system emerged somewhat like AT&T's. The national system and local systems developed. An agency modeled on the ICC was created in 1934 to play referee over prices and services, the Federal Communications Commission, FCC. It operated in the Iron Triangle ICC style, see section 13.7. The FCC succeeded the Federal Radio Commission, but was given authority over both wireless and wired communications. Concentrated ownership got AT&T in trouble with the Department of Justice in the late 1940s, and the DOJ filed a suit to break up the company. A suit dragged on until Eisenhower became president when the suit was dropped. To save face, the consent decree of 1956 forced AT&T to agree not to go into the computer business. At the time, that was taken to be a near-zero-cost decree because of the limited and near-saturated market for early mainframe computers. Was the situation in transportation different? AT&T was the most ownership concentrated of the facilities we are discussing, and there was the attempt to knock it off first. The railroads and truckers were concerned about the antitrust powers of the Department of Justice, and they headed justice off at the past through special legislation, limiting DOJ control over them. DOJ had, from time to time, attempted to limit the roles of the railroad and truck rate bureaus. This was stopped in 1948, when Congress amended Title 49 of the U.S. Code by incorporating the Reed-Bullwinkle Act, which permitted collective rate making under certain circumstances. AT&T next got in trouble over its tight rules on equipment. Implemented to an extreme, only equipment manufactured by Western Electric was allowed to be connected to the system. The non-Bell locals, the largest of which was General Telephone and Electronics, GTE, had their own company, a matter tolerated by AT&T. Those who wanted to be system suppliers complained to the FCC and to the courts. They got partial relief in the courts in the Carter Phone decision of 1968, which allowed use of terminal equipment other than that supplied by AT&T. The market was not opened up quickly. AT&T insisted that it supply interconnect devices to protect its system from foreign equipment. And charges were such that foreign equipment was not so attractive. The new suppliers, now part of the system, asked the FCC to play referee. That put the FCC in a messy situation, but it gradually tilted to support the foreign equipment interests. AT&T simply could not make the case that interconnect equipment was needed. The story here is that of rules for system reliability and such rules are common throughout transportation. The special Western Electric relationship was in part a matter of concentrated ownership, already discussed. AT&T truly perceived that it was in danger, and similarly, those in any transportation system would think they were in danger if there were the potential for rule violations. Seventeen point three: The Bell Cracks The next problem was competition in long line service. Some organizations have had long lines for many years. Railroads in particular had in-house long line service, and as microwave technology advanced, more and more organizations were internalizing service. Microwave Communications Incorporated, MCI, entered the private line business in 1968, and it developed a plan to provide service using microwave towers between St. Louis and Chicago. Its format would be that of an outsider providing private line service as an alternative to an organization building an in-house system. It went to the FCC for permission to provide service, and a 1971 decision enabled operations such as MCIs. Organizations providing service were termed specialized common carriers. MCI soon found that it needed more. It needed many users to attain economies of scale. To manage many users, it needed to connect its between-city system to users in St. Louis and Chicago via the local bell systems. Otherwise, it would have to construct local microwave or hardline collection and distribution systems. To solve that problem, it got a ruling from the FCC for FX services in 1973. The idea was that one office in, say, Chicago would use MCI facilities to reach St. Louis and then connect to the local bell system to reach multiple offices in St. Louis. The AT&T system had for many years subsidized local service from its long line service for numerous reasons. Economies of route density on the long lines resulted in long distance becoming a money machine as traffic grew. Likely more important, though, was the Bell corporate culture and the value it placed on inexpensive, reliable, and nearly universal service. Cross-subsidy was the right thing to do, but if Bell charged MCI its local rates, 
then MCI would be skimming. It would be taking money from AT&T's grossly profitable long lines via a subsidy from AT&T to the collector distribution part of the Bell service. AT&T and MCI began discussions to see if they could work out a solution on rates before going to the FCC to get it blessed. In the meantime, MCI and other firms began to offer FX service. An example is a local number anyone could call from any phone in St. Louis and be connected with an airline reservation desk in Chicago. AT&T offered this service too, that is, its message toll service, MTS. MCI was one of several companies developing similar businesses. There was, for example, Sprint, which originally shared ownership with and ran fiber optic lines along the right-of-way of the Southern Pacific Railroad, the SPR in Sprint. We use MCI as an example because it was the most aggressive company in the first. Nothing was exceptional here. Skimming is an old game in transportation. It is what the common carriers claim private truckers do. The post office says that UPS and Federal Express skim. Cross-subsidy in the telephone system was and remains large. The charge for a long-distance call may have been, by the late 1990s, only a few pennies per minute, but charges to the long-distance carrier to pay for local access were, in 1996, 3 cents per minute on each end of the call, or 6 cents per minute per call. This was in addition to a charge of 650 per subscriber line per year in access charges. In contrast, local calls, particularly rural services, are underpriced. The fact of cross-subsidy is not exceptional. Is the magnitude? Later developments would effectively make the marginal cost of local, long-distance, and international calls free to consumers and pretend the beginning of the end of conventional wire-based telephony. Transportation cross-subsidies have varied. Long-stage air travel once cross-subsidized short-stage, and still does in some cases. Short rides on fixed-rate transit systems subsidize long rides. The largest magnitude of cross-subsidy is in the highway system. It costs a few tenths of a cent to provide for a vehicle kilometer of travel on an urban freeway and, say, 20 cents on a lightly used rural road. Yet, via the gas tax, users pay the same charge for facilities. The 1973 decision by the FCC was soon given an interpretation by MCI and later other specialized carriers that shocked AT&T. FX first was taken to permit one-to-many or many-to-one services, but suppliers decided they could put those together and provide many-to-many services. MCI called it ExecuNet. A subscriber could phone from any number in West Cupcake to any number in East Cupcake. He dialed a local number and accessed a private specialized carrier. The number given to that specialized carrier then accessed a city in a local phone. Costs were less than long line costs because there were no AT&T long line tariffs swollen by cross-subsidies to local phones. AT&T was then shocked by a sweeping suit started in 1974, U.S. vs. AT&T. Long embarrassed by the 1956 consent decree and with its hand strengthened by the flap over interconnect devices, the tension between specialized carriers and AT&T and complaints about service, the Department of Justice sought to break up AT&T. The suit was started by the Ford administration and it is said that the White House had no advanced knowledge of it. Court actions got started and it appeared that an unusually aggressive judge would be able to settle it about four years, a remarkably short time for suits of this class. With concentrated ownership, AT&T was somewhat riper for a suit than actors in transportation systems, a matter of degree. AT&T wasn't as well shielded from the Department of Justice as our transportation operators, again, a matter of degree. The Department of Transportation reviews most transportation mergers. To manage, AT&T brought on star lawyers and planned to make the case that its ownership accounted for the nation's wonderful service. Breaking up AT&T would ruin the best of worlds. To deal with this suit and the many-to-many competitive services that were expanding, AT&T sponsored the Consumer Communications Reform Act of 1976, CCRA. That's a wonderful title, but the purpose of the bill was to legalize the AT&T monopoly. It was dubbed the Bell Bill. AT&T thought passage was certain. It brought managers and labor from every congressional district to lobby. It thought that the public held the in-house AT&T view that its activities were right. Bell did not read very well the shift of public and congressional views about monopolies. At the same time the Bell Bill was at debate, there was a well-supported legislation moving along that would increase government power over monopoly. The Bell Bill did not pass. The AT&T corporate culture held one worldview. The rest of the world held another. AT&T pointed to the ex- excellence of the Bell Labs, see section 17.5, the availability and low cost of domestic service, and leadership in the installation of advanced equipment. It compared its system favorably with those in other nations. Such internalization of information and values is a feature of transportation systems. 
For instance, the Federal Highway Administration sees its world exactly as AT&T saw theirs. AT&T was a dif- in a difficult situation in the late 1970s. Failure of the CCRA hurt deeply, and Justice's aim was massive dismemberment. Justice had presented its case. Bell had begun its defense, a defense building from the image Bell had counted on for support of CCRA. What Bell does is right, and the proof is in the product. It would be unthinkable to ruin that product. Two changes pulled the fat from the fire. First, there was a modest management turnover in Bell when Charlie Brown became chairman. We say modest because Brown was an inside manager who had similar background to his predecessor. Although committed to Bell ideals, Brown saw that the Bell strategy was not working, and he began inside discussions about giving up some local companies as the cost of a settlement. The other change was the return of the Republicans to office in Washington. During the campaign, the justice case against Bell had been cited as a destructive anti-business extreme. New management at the Department of Defense said the destruction of AT&T would be damaging. Although the new administration judged it could not bear the political cost of dropping the justice suit, there was a possibility of settlement short of complete dismemberment. Charlie Brown developed an, the inter intra scheme, spinning off of the local bells, and sold it within AT&T. Next, that solution was sold to justice in the White House. It was much more painful than the Kingsbury Commitment of 1919 and the Consent Decree of 1958, but was far short of complete dismemberment. The Consent Decree, as of January 1, 1984, created an AT&T that included Western Electric, Bell Labs, and Long Lines, and seven independent regional Bell operating companies, referred to as RBOX, at the time 9X, Bell Atlantic, Bell South, Southwestern Bell, Ameritech, U.S. West, and Pacific Telesis. The RBOX were prohibited, prohibited from providing long-distance service, and AT&T could not enter local markets. All the King's Horses The Arbox over time have done some merging and recombining among themselves. Ninex, Bell Atlantic, AirTouch, Cellular, and GTE formed what is now called Verizon. Bell South, Pacific Telesis, Ameritech, and Southwestern Bell formed what became SBC Communications. SBC Communications then acquired what was left of AT&T and took that name. U.S. West was acquired by a new long-distance company, Quest, founded by SP Rail, the parent of Southern Pacific Railway, the same people who founded Sprint, which was later acquired by a rural telephone company, CenturyLink. AT&T spun off Western Electric and Bell Labs as Lucent, which in 2006 merged with the French equipment manufacturer Alcatel. Alcatel began life as La Compagnie Générale d'Electricité, CGE, and had acquired the telecommunications unit of ITT Corporation, which began as International Telephone and Telegraph, serving mainly the Caribbean and Latin America. CGE produced TGV train sets, among other things. While there are lots of firms and undoubtedly too many names to remember, the story can be recalled due to its similarity of the merging behavior of railroads. The Communications Act of 1996 permitted the RBOX to get into long-distance business again, and thus sell integrated services, if they could demonstrate competition in local telephone markets to the satisfaction of the FCC. Some have been able to do so, though they clearly still, as of this writing, have an effective monopoly on local wireline telephone. AT&T tried to re-enter the local market from two angles, acquiring a large cellular telephone company, McCaw Cellular, and acquiring large cable television companies, Telecommunications Incorporated and Media One being the most important. Both have been spun off. McCaw Cellular, renamed AT&T Wireless, was acquired by Singular, a joint venture between SBC and Bell South. Those latter two companies merged and later acquired AT&T, so it was, in a sense, spun back together. Comcast and others acquired AT&T's cable television assets. 17.5. Bell Labs Bell Labs grew along with the recognition of the importance of science and technology, and they were by no means unique. IBM with Watson, RCA with Sarnoff, DuPont, GE, and many other strong labs grew at the same time. Later, the automobile and drug companies developed strong labs. In these labs, there has always been a tension between doing general, more basic research work versus product-oriented work for the corporation. Although well-known for its scientific work, counting 13 Nobel Prizes among its scientists, the Bell Labs did most of its work for the company, a fact not generally known. The labs were divided after divestiture. First was a lab owned by the local companies, now Telcordia, a unit of SAIC, originally the Central Services Organization, and then Bell Communications Research, or Bellcor. Second was the Bell Labs owned by AT&T spinoff Lucent Technologies, the former Western Electric, 
A third lab, AT&T Laboratory, was created in 1996 after the Lucent spinoff. The cable TV industry has emulated the practice since 1988 with cable labs. The world of science and technology is so large that private labs cannot get the resources for broad command of relevant fields. Costs are too high for a private company no matter how large and rich it is. The Ford Motor Company, for instance, has backed away from its commitment to a broad-based research program. The Ford Research Lab was downgraded decades ago. Other automobile manufacturers more recently. There are now many reasons that firms more and more choose to buy when making make-or-buy decisions. In short, Bell Labs would have had problems regardless of the breakup of the company. Seventeen point six discussion. From its point of view, what mistakes did AT and T make? First, it didn't protect itself from the Department of Justice. We suppose that's because it felt that what it was doing was right, and no one would question it. When it made an effort via the Bell Act, it was too late. If AT and T had made that effort earlier, when telephone service was being deployed and services were rapidly improving, it might have been able to have favorable legislation passed. This strong feeling of right also led AT and T to play hardball with foreign suppliers and MCI. Cooperation and co-optation might have been better tactics. In the consent decree of 1956, AT&T agreed that it would not enter the computer business. Hindsight says this may have been a bad decision, but at that time no one saw the subsequent growth of the computer business. At any rate, it isn't clear that AT&T would have been successful in the computer business during this period. A later acquisition and divestiture of computer maker National Cash Register, NCR, demonstrating the point. Computers were not a part of their corporate culture and mission. We are struck by parallels between FHWA and AT&T. The FHWA has been in trouble from time to time. As the Bureau of Public Roads, it was in danger in 1920 after the breakup of roads during World War I. When Eisenhower was president, he brought in Commissioner DuPont to ease out Chief McDonald and close down the Bureau. The nation was in a get-the-feds-out-of-the-way mood. The interstate program saved the Bureau. In a way, the Federal Highway Administration is in trouble now, and there is nothing like the interstate waiting in the wings. Recall MCI's specialized service. It invaded the money-making long-line business and took advantage of the subsidy to local service. Isn't that exactly what a toll road does? It's no wonder the Federal Highway Administration has, despite supporting a few experiments, an anti-toll road stance. FHWA has a feeling of self-evident right that so characterized AT&T. It plays hardball with those who disagree, and it has the Bell Labs, the truth is from our work problem. In 1989, there were 2,691,793 cell phone subscribers in the United States. There are now more mobile phones than citizens in the United States, over 327 million mobile phones versus 314 million residents as of 2012. The one-way car radio, popularized by Motorola in the 1930s, has been standard equipment for many decades. Mobile two-way radio, untethering the communicator from the physical network wires, has long been used in special applications. Police radio, military, ship to shore. It has been seen as the future since at least Star Trek and the communicator allowed Captain Kirk to speak to crew members on a remote planet. And ironically, much of the technology of 1960s Star Trek set in the 23rd century already seems bulky and clumsy today. The development of mobile phones and in recent years internet-enabled mobile phones has changed how people communicate, how people interact with their environment, where and when people travel, and so on. The implications are numerous. The development has not, however, been one of inventors in the garage, but of systematic funding and deployment of networks by large incumbent operators. While new players emerge, Silicon Valley companies like Apple and Google entering the handset market, the back end itself is managed by large traditional telcos. In the United States, the two largest players are AT&T and Verizon, spun out of, from AT&T after the consent decree and whose wireless division was for many years partially owned by Vodafone, descended from a British telecom equipment maker, Raycall. The next two largest players are Sprint and T-Mobile, a unit of Deutsche Telekom. It takes large organizations to build, operate, and maintain and rebuild nationwide networks. There are multiple companies operating in most countries, providing vigorous competition in this fast-changing sector. Standards are continually being upgraded, and there is some hope of convergence so any phone can be used on any network, as has been possible in Europe with GSM for over a decade. Bandwidth is a potential bottleneck as more and more bits are slung through the air, although many possible technological solutions present themselves and will be employed as scarcity becomes costly.